This is Timothy Rodigus talking about high contrast LBTAO images of debris disks at two to four microns. Can people hear me? Yes? Okay. Uh, I'm TJ Rodigus, a fifth year graduating uh, PhD student at the University of Arizona. Uh, much of the work uh, that I'll be presenting is going into my thesis. Uh, and I'll be starting at uh, Carnegie DTM in the fall to work with Alicia Weinberger on, all the, on uh, more, of this, more of this work. So why, why should we image debris at uh, two to four microns? Well, at these longer wavelengths, uh, you have uh, higher strail, so you get higher contrast, so you can see uh, things closer to the stars, uh, typically where planets might form. They, you know, they're, they're, they're usually found close to the stars. Uh, we're not seeing them at wide separations, so uh, the, the higher contrast you have, the better chance you have of seeing an interesting uh, planet close to the star. And if you don't see one, uh, having high contrast allows you to see warps and sharp edges, and those are clues to unseen planets. Um, at, at this wavelength range, you also have, you, you can constrain interesting parts uh, about uh, the dust composition and size. In particular, water ice and organics uh, both have interesting uh, absorption features at 3.1 microns. So if you can obtain resolved images between two and four microns, you can potentially constrain how much water ice and organic material is in a debris disk. And then uh, th this window is also especially sensitive to self-luminous exoplanets, as almost all the uh, planets that have been found are, are being detected at H, you know, uh, K, and L prime. These are hot wavelengths. So how do you actually uh, image disks at uh, two to four microns? Uh, well, everything glows in the infrared every warm surface glows. So uh, you want to minimize the number of warm surfaces, surfaces that you have. Uh, and in order to do that, you, when you do that, you minimize your noise. So the way to do that is you, at least Arizona's take on this, is to use an adaptive secondary mirror, where the, the, your secondary is actually what's uh, doing the adaptive optics. And when you, when you do that, you get images like, like I'm showing here on the right. Um, the, the top one is from the LBT, LBTI, um, you're seeing two images there because both telescopes have secondaries. And so you, you make two images, and they both show up on the detector. And you can combine them, you can null them, uh, you can do all sorts of fun things with them. And then on the bottom, I'm showing a, a recent image from MAGAO with Clio, the infrared camera there. And there's something like 13 airy rings. So these are excellent images we're producing. So just a brief note on how LBTI works. You have your two secondaries, your two adaptive secondaries. The light comes in uh, from both sides, and then it's combined, or you can null it, you can combine it, you can just add it. You can block one side, and uh, the long wavelength light, the, you know, the 10 micron light, can be sent to simultaneously to uh, NOMIC, which is you know, the, the, the 10 micron detector, and that's being used for a large exozoity survey being run by Phil Hins and NASA and many others that are actually in this room called HOSTS. And then the one to five micron light gets sent to ElmerCam, which, uh, which is being used by Andy Skemmer to perform a, a large uh, search for planets around nearby stars. Uh, and that's called LEACH. And the, the work I'm presenting used, uh, used ElmerCam, just the one aperture and the one to five micron light. And for more information on this, please see the posters by uh, Vanessa Bailey and, and Denis Dufresne. Oh, yeah, and uh, the, the point here is uh, you can't be the, the, uh, a PI of a multi-million dollar uh, you know, system without having a nice tagline. And uh, Phil's tagline is tomorrow's resolution today because uh, it's a, you, you have a 23 meter uh, telescope. You're getting the resolution of that already. So it's kind of like ELT right now. And uh, LBTI and MAGAO have a sort of a friendly rivalry. Um, and LBTI thinks it's better than MAGAO, but MAGAO has this claim to fame, which is potentially the highest resolution image ever obtained in the universe. Uh, it's a 0 .03, 0 .03 arc second binary. Uh, ask Laird about it. Uh, he, he published it. Um, but it's a spectacular image. And, and you can do this with, with VIS-AO, Visible Light Adaptive Optics. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and both these, both LBTI and Mageo have great blogs. You can decide for yourself which one's funnier. Um, and, and please see the talk by Katie Morzinski on Wednesday. She'll be talking about some interesting Mageo results. So now onto some actual disk science. 
HD15115. It's a very famous debris disk. Um, it's an F-star nearby. Uh, in 2007, Paul Callis imaged it, and it's very asymmetric. It extends out to you know, 12 arc seconds. Something weird is going on here. If you look at, at, at further wavelengths, it's already looking more symmetric. Uh, as you go to H-band, and then here are the new images that I've obtained with, L with uh, LBT Elmer Cam. This is last year, this is K-band, and I'll make this bigger in a second, but just want to show for scale here, this is L prime now. So there's some serious changes going on as you go to longer wavelengths. Uh, these are those two images again. Uh, basically what they're showing is that the disk is much more symmetric as you get to longer wavelengths compared to shorter wavelengths. So something interesting is going on, we're seeing um, something is changing as we go to longer wavelengths. We can also see with, this, with these high resolution images that the disk is bowed, it's bow shaped. And uh, rather than invoking some complicated dynamical process, uh, this can partially, this can probably be explained just by a simple viewing geometry. If we're seeing a, a, an, a, an inclined ring with mostly forward scattering grains, then you get, you get mostly, you can see what's going on here. You, you reproduce the disk fairly well although this model is not exactly unique, but it's a, it's a simple model, so we like it. Uh, we're also seeing surface brightness asymmetries and evidence for a possible gap. So the surface brightness asymmetries, on, for the K-band image, you have a, a surface brightness asymmetry between the two sides of the disk. But at L prime, at 3.8 microns, you don't see that. So that means we're seeing two different grain distributions between two and four microns. And that gap I was talking about is, you know, for an edge on disk, your surface brightness should keep rising as you get closer to the, to the star, but it, it drops. And there's actually SED evidence uh, suggesting that uh, there should be a gap at 45 AU. And so we may be seeing low signal noise evidence for that, although this should be confirmed. So if you look at the colors of K minus L, um, what we're seeing is basically that there's zero color. Remember this was like the blue needle you know, very, uh, very asymmetric, small grains. And what we're seeing is that there's basically large grains, at least between K and L. And if you put all, all the information together and look at this high-tech cartoon I made in Keynote, you basically see that um, you, have, you have the large grains close to the star orbiting in stable orbits, and then you have the small grains uh, that are getting blown out by radiation pressure, and on the east side, they're heading straight into the ISM because the star, it, we, we believe, is, is moving into the ISM. So how about HD 32297? It's another interesting disk. It's young, it's bright, it's edge on, so that makes it very nice and easy for us to detect. Um, I'm showing here HST images from John Devis. And then uh, recently, Thane Curry and uh, Anthony Bacaletti, both around the same time, obtained uh, KS band images from the ground with Keck and VLT, I believe, of the disk. And they, they found some interesting features. Notably, there's an asymmetry between the two sides and a flattening, which might suggest multiple belts. All the more reason for, for us to look at this at long wavelengths and see what's going on. So what does it look like at L prime? It looks very nice. It looks just like the K-band image, actually. Um, and if you compare this to what we did with HD 15115 last year, at the same wavelength, we've really improved things. Um, these disks are not that, not that different in terms of surface brightness. And, but we, we were able to obtain a lot more integration, get a lot more rotation. Uh, we had a new detector, 400 modes of AO. Uh, so we really improved things. So if you look at uh, the spectrum of the, of the disk dust that we have so far with the data that we have, and especially with this new L prime data point, we can start to play around with what the dust might be, what, what, what it might be made of. And uh, we have here just this plot that John Debs made uh, just a few days ago. Um, uh, we have three different uh, compositions here, water ice, tholins, and silicates, and then silicates, carbon, and, and ice. And we can, you can see that uh, the data are sort of flat or rising at the near, in, near infrared side of things, and then they drop at 3.8 microns. And th this model does not do a good job matching that drop, but these two do. These two are particularly interesting because those are ingredients for life, you know, water and organic material. Very interesting. So this is all very preliminary, though. It's, I'm working on the paper, uh, but th this will be improved. We also injected uh, artificial planets to see how, wh wh what we could have detected if they were there. And I'll note that we put them um, not out around the star, like I did for 15115, actually, but actually in the plane of the disk, because odds are, if there's a planet, it's in there, not out here. 
So, uh, and th these three Jupiter mass planets are basically all recovered, um, but uh, close to the star, uh, because the disk is so bright, you're basically not, uh, you're not going to be able to see that planet there, uh, which, which is actually kind of interesting. Um, and one Jupiter mass planets, I wouldn't call any of those detected. They're at the same locations. Um, so, so there's interesting things potentially going on here. Okay, so this is brand new stuff from uh, Magellan. Uh, so it's basically, uh, we, we obtained this just a few months ago in the second commissioning run um, from MAG-AO. This is HR 4796. So we obtained an image at 3.8 microns and, we're, and we're, we're seeing the disk all the way, you know, the ring all the way around the star, uh, which has not really been done before. And at a long wavelength too. And the residuals here, if you'll notice, they basically die past 0.3 arc seconds. And there's no coronagraph either. This is just direct imaging. So this is, this is pretty, this is showing that the MAGAO system is, is pretty good. Um, but we didn't stop there. We also got an image at 3.3 microns and an image at 3.1 microns. That's pretty hard to do because the atmosphere is pretty opaque at those wavelengths. Um, but with these three, we can start to play around with water ice and organics in the disk, that kind of modeling. We also obtained other images, 2.15 microns, sorry, that's covered there. And then also three visible, essentially visible light images. And these are, these were made by Jared Mails, the new Sagan fellow. Um, and this is using VizAO. And these, are, these images are very nice. At, at K-band, I'll point out that um, these streamers have resurfaced. And I, I believe these now, because all this data was reduced exactly the same way. So it's unlikely that this is a product of ADI or, or, or PCA or anything like that. More likely that th this is actually something, something going on. And all this is in, is, uh, in preparation. Now, with the, with the data I just presented, you can uh, start to play around with uh, the spectrum of the, of the dust and see what it's potentially made of. And so this is all, again, preliminary. And these models were done by and the data are from John Debs, but uh, at 3.1 microns, we're somewhere in this range. At 3.3, we're somewhere here. And at 3.8, we're down here. So we can't, at least yet, pin something down. I, I have to work on the forward modeling uh, you know, involved in PCA. But uh, we can probably rule this one out, this one here, porous ice, silicate, and carbon. And there's probably some sort of absorption going on uh, beyond three microns. So what that actually is, whether it's water ice, organics, or something else, is to be determined. Uh, but we're working on it. And with that, I'll leave the summary of what we've done. Open questions. words about the organics that you're finding? What are they and where are they? Well, I wouldn't say that we're finding them, um, but I, I'll say that the, what we're modeling is these the tholins, which is a, a general term for th things that are found on uh, Titan. Um, they're found in, in, in icy comets in the solar system. And, uh, and, and so basically that tholins is just a general term for or organic goo. And uh, so that, that's what we're playing around with right now. And whether they're there or not, uh, we still have to really pin that down. That's, that would be pretty important if they, if they were there. Hey, um, there was a prediction from the mid-infrared images of HR 4796 that there, were, there was a, would be an offset in the center of symmetry. Do you see that in the image? So uh, I, haven't, I haven't calculated it yet, but um, I, I've been playing around with model disks. And in order to make the model disk a better match, I had to move it off the, the center of the star. Uh, by a little bit, and so it looks like there is uh, an it, it's not uh, it's eccentric and off center. So yeah, it looks like that's right. Uh, question up in the back, Marshall. These are gorgeous images, in particular the 4796 in visible light. Now you're commenting that you thought the uh, the so-called streamers were not an ADI artifact. Um, we, we mean their existence or the fact they're only seen at the ANSI? Because you're only seeing them at the ANSI, right, because of the, the self-subtraction, I, I believe. The, Sorry, you, what, your question? So, so the, my, my point is that uh, it's, if you look at like the, the Wainsley paper 
you know, you, you, you can see that these ANSI, that the extremer, streamer's material is present at, not just at the ANSI, oh. but at the whole azimuths around the disk. Do you, do you agree with that interpretation? Well, I, I, I would agree with that because that explains how you would see them. If it's very small grains, then uh, you only see them where you have the highest optical depth, and that just happens to be, uh, you know, at the ANSI. So uh, I, I think that makes sense. Not, let's thank Timothy again.